You'll see the notes say session two. It's uh, the second part of a 15-part series that myself and Stuart Greaves are teaching on John chapter 16. We're going to be doing it throughout the spring here in 2023. I'm titling this Persecution, the Seminary of the Holy Spirit. Because in the context of persecution, the Holy Spirit brings uh, new dimensions of insight into God's heart and his leadership over our lives. And there's things that we learn and, and uh, perceptions we have in the place of persecution that are different than any other context in our spiritual life. Now, the premise is a statement that I've, the premise to this whole thing is a statement I've made many times over the years, is that when we come under pressure or under persecution, it changes our conversation. Meaning, because of pressure or pain, humans, they seek for a solution. We've got to find a solution to the pressure, the pain, the persecution. And when you fear the Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit, what's the solution? What happens is it changes the conversation because we begin to ask different questions to the Lord. We begin to talk different to him. We have different prayers, different conversations in our family context. We preach different messages. In our fellowship together, we talk about different things. And that shifting of the conversation and that asking different questions, that opens our heart and makes us more sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leadership and his wisdom and his solutions to those problems. And in that sense, he gives us more insight and trains us and emboldens us. More Holy Spirit activity happens. We get more insight into Jesus' heart and leadership and his ways. And it transforms us. That's why persecution is part of God's plan together with the Holy Spirit of transforming the body of Christ. And that's going to happen in a very heightened way in the generation the Lord returns. Well, let's look at Roman numeral 1. This is a bit of review that I've given in other sessions. I'll say in paragraph A, we'll start with there. Persecution is both a demonic attack that is to hinder our spiritual growth, but it's also a divine gift to enhance our spiritual growth. The enemy has an agenda for persecution, but God has a different one, and they have it at the same time over our lives. Paul made a very uh, strong statement in Philippians 1, verse 29. He said, it's been granted for you. God has given it to you. The idea is as a gift is the idea that you would suffer for his name's sake. Now, the suffering in context to the New Testament in verses like this, it's not talking about suffering sickness or, a, you know, financial bankruptcy or a family crisis, but it's talking specifically about the suffering of persecution for being loyal to Jesus and our love and in our stand and our boldness. Paul says it's granted to us. God gives us this gift because he knows, Paul did, that uh, responding to God in a right way in persecution, it transforms our character and it transforms our understanding. So we gain benefits from it in this age, but Paul really emphasizes this, we gain dynamic benefits from it in the age to come. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul said our affliction, and again, he means persecution here. He doesn't mean, again, a family tragedy or sickness. He means standing true for Jesus. It's working for us, catch this, a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. When believers are persecuted and they respond rightly, in the age to come, there's a far more exceeding response of heavenly reward from the Father. There's quite a few verses in the New Testament that highlight this principle. Paragraph B, the apostles rejoiced. When they suffered, they rejoiced that they were found worthy to suffer for his name. Now that's a pretty radical shift from how the apostles first faced persecution. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, 
The apostles fled in fear. They abandoned Jesus, and some of them betrayed him on that night. Here in Acts chapter 5, it's about a year or two later. Different scholars have different uh, time frames, maybe 12 or 18 months. Their view of persecution shifted so dramatically that instead of running in fear, they rejoiced for the privilege of it. And there's quite a few verses in the, in the New Testament where the apostles are declaring they're rejoicing for it. So the question we ask, what is it that they understood that we don't understand? Well, they understood the benefits. They understood what God's commitments were to intervene and help us in the place of persecution. I'm determined by the grace of God to understand what they understood because I know the Holy Spirit wants to reveal it to his church. I don't believe that today, particularly in the West, myself included, that we have a deep understanding of the apostolic revelation of the benefit of suffering. But I believe the Lord's gonna give it to his end time church. So multitudes will see the benefit and experience the spirit of glory and they will be able, millions before this is over, they will be able to rejoice before the Lord in the place of persecution instead of running and failing and drawing back in fear, which is our normal response today. Because we only understand mostly the demonic agenda, but we've gotta understand the divine gift. And my prayer, and I, and I believe it's gonna happen, that in our community here in the months and years ahead, we're gonna become really familiar with the larger body of scripture of the understanding of persecution from the apostolic revelation, that point of view. Look in paragraph C, I'll just, I'll highlight one verse that <clears throat> talks about the transformation that happens in the life of a believer. There's quite a few verses that say this. But Peter says it in, such a strong way in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. He says, he who has suffered in the flesh, and again, he's not talking sickness, not talking about a trial uh, in their life in other situations, and the Bible has a lot to say on those subjects, but that's not what he's talking about here. The person that has suffered in the flesh persecution, this is almost, it seems like it's exaggerated. Peter says, they've ceased from sin. They no longer live for lust like they used to. Like, really? And what Peter's really saying is, in the place of, of persecution, their, ask, their conversation with the Lord is so different. The questions are different. Their goals are different. Their expectations are different. What they're longing for is different. And it shifts their whole inner man to a different carrying themselves in a different way. They cease from sin, or their lives are transformed in their perspective as well as their heart and their character. Well, Peter goes on in verse 14 in the same chapter to give a little insight in how that transformation happens. He goes, if you're reproached or persecuted is the idea, the spirit of glory will rest on you in a greater measure is the idea that when we're persecuted and we talk to the Lord and really reach to him with a heart of devotion, even though in our, our flesh we're weak and fearful, but in that context, there's a heightened and increase of Holy Spirit activity called the spirit of glory. Well, let's look at Roman numeral two. And again, in this 15-part series that we're just endeavoring on John chapter 16, we're doing on Friday nights, Jesus is talking about the importance of preparing, well, the apostles, but the church through history, but particularly, if you read Matthew 24, the end time church is in focus, and Jesus is thinking as well. Paragraph A, in that final week of Jesus' ministry, he elaborated, he gave more details on the Tuesday and on the Thursday, the two main teaching days of his last uh, week of ministry. And he highlighted the joyful but also the painful, challenging aspects of discipleship. And the part I want you to really catch here, in John 15 and 16, is how Jesus emphasized they need to remember what he's teaching them. 
because by remembering, they put themselves in the position to be empowered with new understanding and grace on their heart by remembering. Because if they remember it, they'll talk to God more about it. They'll talk to one another more about it. They'll, they'll pray more about it if they remember. John chapter 15, verse 19, Jesus said, the world hates you, and he, and he talks a bit about that. Well, he first introduced the idea of being hated by all the nations two days earlier on Tuesday in Matthew 24, verse 9, but here he breaks, he gives more detail to it. And we've covered some of that in our last semester. But verse 20 is what I want to highlight. He goes, I want you to remember. I want you to remember they're going to persecute you. Don't forget that. Anticipate it. Don't be shocked by it. Be prepared for it in your conversation with me and even in your fellowship with one another. But know this, verse 26. When I send the Holy Spirit, which he did on the day of Pentecost, about six weeks later, he goes, the Spirit is coming and he's gonna testify of me. He's gonna tell you more about my heart and my leadership. He's gonna reveal and empower you to walk in my values. You're gonna have new goals when the Spirit tells you about me and marks your heart and marks your understanding. And that's the phrase, the verse I'm using and calling it that we are in, uh, uh, engaging in the seminary of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit has many things to teach us, but some things are very specifically taught us in a unique way in the context of being persecuted. He says in chapter 16, verse 1, he goes, these things I'm telling you, he goes, my goal is that you would not stumble. And the word stumble here, well, you'll see in the notes, is that you would not deny me and fall away. I'm telling you things and calling you to remember it so that your heart would be emboldened. You would understand the benefits of what's going to happen when they persecute you, and you will understand that I will help you. You will see my commitments to you. Then he says, really, two dramatic statements in verse 2. John 16, verse 2. We'll look at this in a minute, but this is a bombshell. He says, they're going to kick you out of the synagogues. And that's a big thing, as most of us are Gentiles. We might not understand this, but the entire Jewish social life and economy and relationships were rooted deeply in synagogue life. You're going to be censored and driven out of the spiritual community that you've been raised in. Because many of them will not accept Jesus' teaching. That's a huge statement that you could miss as a Gentile, the significance of this. He goes, but it's not gonna end there with relational and financial and social persecution. It's gonna be physical too. Some of you will be killed. Then he says in verse four, I want you to remember this. If you, for, if you don't remember it's going to happen, why it's going to happen, what the benefits are when it happens, what God's commitments are to you when it happens, you will be far more vulnerable, verse one, to stumble. And again, in this context, to stumble means in the ultimate sense of denying the Lord. <clears throat> Look at paragraph B. Now in John <clears throat> 13 to 17, these five chapters that myself and Stuart are are doing about 100 sessions over about a two or three year period, line by line on Friday nights through John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm so encouraged, I'm invigorated by the study. I'm surprised on how much it's touching my heart and illumining my own understanding. But in John 13 to 17, these five chapters that Jesus taught in the upper room on the, at the Last Supper, in context of the Last Supper, Five passages are about the Holy Spirit. And each one of those five passages has a particular context of what the Spirit will do in that particular situation. And here in John 15, verse 26, it's what the Spirit will do in context to persecution. And each of the other four, and we've highlighted them and we're developing them, we want to see what the Spirit is doing unique in context what he promised to do. It's fantastic revelation that Jesus has given us. Paragraph B, 
in the context of persecution, he's gonna teach God's people. Because remember, they've, the ch conversation's changing. They're seeking solutions, so they're asking new questions, and they're getting more understanding, and they're getting connected together in this new way of thinking, new goals, new alignment with God's heart. And I have some of the things the Holy Spirit's gonna teach them how to grow in love, how to grow in mercy, humility, generosity, gratitude. Now, we grow in these things apart from persecution, but when we grow in them in context of persecution, there's unique dimensions to each of these areas. Mercy and humility has a different dimension in the place of persecution than it does without. And in all the contexts, it's relevant. But I wanna see the fullness of what we will learn as a spiritual family in the years ahead in these different areas. Paragraph C, he says twice here in John 15 and 16, I want you to remember. Remembering it's going to happen, why it's going to happen, what's gonna to happen to you, what the benefits are, is critical to you being spiritually prepared. It's critical to you having a vibrant heart. He says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, John would say some decades later, after, you know, in John 15, it's the night before Jesus would go to the cross and die on Friday the uh, next day. But this is decades later. John is staying with this teaching Jesus gave, he received in John 15 from Jesus. And he says, don't marvel if the world hates you. And what he means by that is don't be shocked and surprised. Because if you're shocked and surprised when you're hated, you'll be far more vulnerable to being offended at God and fearful of persecution. He goes, begin to realign your expectation that if you are true to what Jesus says and uh, to his messaging, they will hate you. Now in the Western world, the body of Christ as, as, a, uh, as a whole, we're not familiar, we don't think much about persecution. I mean, in the last couple of years, we've seen different believers being persecuted economically with some different sanctions and censorship, some economic persecution, and it's like scandalous to the church. And I appreciate us not being happy about that and the government, et cetera, et cetera. But the many believers are going, can you believe it? And the Spirit would say something like, that's only the beginning of the beginning. Don't be scandalized by it in the sense of you're shocked, surprised. You'll be far more vulnerable to be overcome if you don't understand this is part of the kingdom lifestyle, particularly in the end time church. It will be really highlighted in the, in the, in the generation where the great harvest, the billion so harvest, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit like no time in history, and there'll be persecution like no time in history. Don't be shocked. Don't marvel. Don't be surprised, but begin to align your expectation. Begin to picture the future with this as part of it, part of the kingdom lifestyle that we're called to. Look at top of page two. Paragraph E on the notes here. He goes, why am I telling you this teaching? Why am I telling you these things? So you wouldn't stumble. You would be far more vulnerable to stumble, which means fall away. When we're talking about the ultimate stumbling of, the, of denying the faith, that's what he's talking about. He goes in, and I'm thinking of so many in the Western church right now, the church in the Western world is so unprepared, so unaware of this, and the vulnerability to stumbling and, and falling away is far more tense. Now, I'm, I, I'm concerned by that, and I have urgency, but also I have confidence. There's gonna be millions the Lord's gonna line up with his leadership and his heart and release a spirit of power on their hearts. So I know there's gonna be millions and millions that are not yet prepared today, but they will be. I have here in paragraph E, our greatest danger as a believer is not in being persecuted, physically or financially or socially, our greatest danger is spiritual, it's falling away. Falling away from the faith, I'm talking about the ultimate falling away, is far worse than physical harm or physical persecution or penalties. 
Paragraph F here. We can be equipped by seeing what the Spirit says, what the Scripture says about the certainty of persecution. Again, this is not in the conversation in the church and our nation much, but I believe we're going to look back in a few years. Many ministries will be, this will be part of their, their, their spiritual family conversation. It won't be the only thing. It won't be the main thing, but it will have an important place in the conversation of spiritual families all over this nation and ministries. We are equipped by seeing what the scripture says. It's really gonna come and increase, number one. We'll be equipped by talking to the Lord more about it. The more we talk to the Lord, and what I mean is, Lord, I set my heart. If there's financial persecution, if there's physical if family and loved ones are at risk, if property's at risk, and, and I bring these things to him, I say, this is what I set my heart to do. Not that by the setting of our heart it's all done with, but we begin to change little by little. Our understanding grows, grace increases, we get more confidence. It's little by little, step by step, but it really happens if we, if we take hold of this exhortation, remember, don't let this subject be absent from your spiritual conversation with God and in your spiritual family. Look at paragraph G. Paul said in Acts 14, he said, we enter the kingdom through many tribulations. And again, remember, he's talking persecution here. He's not talking just about your car broke down, your business collapsed, you know, a, a tragedy happened, your house burned, and that's not what he's talking about, which are horrible things. That's not what he's talking about here. He's saying you enter the kingdom through many tribulations, not a few, but, and they're progressive, they're here and there, they're different in different seasons of our life. Now, when Paul says we enter the kingdom, he does not, he's not talking about the day you're born again, you enter the kingdom initially because you were persecuted, so now you're born again. That's not what he's saying. He's talking to disciples who are already born again. And he's saying you will experience more kingdom activity as persecution increases and you respond to the Lord right. You will enter, you will experience more. That's a very positive statement. So much so that he strengthened the disciples with that because they understood he was saying something very positive. If you don't have the New Testament revelation of persecution, which we don't, I'm a little bit, I got a little bit, but I got a lot, a lot more to go of understanding. So I'm not claiming some great insight, but I'm claiming a zeal to get more insight. I would have said Paul warned the disciples about persecution. He didn't. He strengthened them by telling them the benefits of it and what God's commitments were to them in it. Now, my burden is this. Many young believers, I'm thinking about our nation, but many nations, and particularly in the West, but other outside the West as well. I'm not picking on the Western church. I love the Western church. I is one, you know, I'm part of it. I love the church in our nation. So I'm not looking at it critical. I, I have great confidence there's gonna be a huge recovery of the spiritual dullness that's so prevailing right now in the spiritual weakness. But today, when I look at the last 10 or 20 years, and beyond that as well, many young believers are being trained in the gospel, in leadership, in ministry, opposite of what Paul taught. They're being told, they're being uh, trained and discipled in a, imagining they will avoid it and they will escape all pressures and persecutions. It's just absolutely not true. And they're being taught that the most effective and the best way to talk about Jesus is only to emphasize the positive things he said and avoid totally the unpopular things that he said. I love the popular things Jesus said. I mean, I love free forgiveness. I mean, who loves it? I love free forgiveness. I love the resurrection. I love the power of God. I love the Holy Spirit's ministry, many things. But Jesus didn't only teach popular truths, which he did, and we love them. He taught unpopular truths. And the, one of the big reasons why most of the church in the West hasn't faced this hatred 
Because, I mean, the vast majority of the 500,000 congregations in America, there's a few more than that, mostly only talk about the positive things he said. Once, once we begin to embrace and proclaim the, naked, the, the, the uh, unpopular things, the whole counsel of God, that's when the hatred will begin to emerge. Because a lot of folks look around and go, I don't see any great problem. That's because we're only saying part of the message. But before the Lord returns, he's going to have a faithful bride, a prepared bride, body of Christ worldwide, that will be loyal to his leadership and to his messaging. And the Lord is, is beginning to move us. The Spirit is in that direction. Young people are taught to remove the offensive things in their gospel preaching. And more unbelievers will listen, and more unbelievers will like them. And they think, wow, that's what, but it's just, it's opposite of the apostolic gospel of the New Testament in the book of Acts. The Christian culture in the West, again, sounds like I'm picking on us, but no, I, I'm committed to us. I'm part of the West. The Christian uh, culture in the West teaches young people, I want you to catch this, you already know it anyway, but that physical safety, or add the word comfort, or safety is a good word, and financial prosperity, these are the main signs, the primary signs of God's grace and God's favor. Now, there is a dimension of the grace of God with physical safety and financial blessing. There is a dimension. It's not the primary sign of God's favor and God's grace. They've embraced this distorted gospel without making any hard or deliberate choices with eternal values in place. Most of them are not making life choices, financial choices, sin choices, thinking of eternity. They're mostly thinking of now and comfort and increase and influence. And that's leaves the church in great spiritual weakness and failure right now. Paragraph H, one of the primary weaknesses today the, of the, whatever the, some say 20 million, some say 50 million believers, some say 70 million, I don't know. They, it depends on what they call a believer in America. But the millions of believers, the vast majority, maybe they don't articulate it, but they have a deep commitment in their soul. And they have a very strong mental expectation to enjoy a lifestyle under Jesus' leadership that I call the gospel of the American dream, which means the primary thing that happens if you really obey Jesus is you're gonna have personal comfort more, you're gonna have more friends, you're gonna have more financial blessing, you're gonna have more prominence and influence if you really obey him, that's the signs of it, and that's not the New Testament gospel. And just for the record, I love more personal comfort. I love financial prosperity. I like it if you like me. I like all those things. But that's not the primary message of the apostolic gospel. I like it when it happens, but that's not the primary thing we're aiming for. And I am always grateful for whatever measure God will give. The reason why this error is so serious and why this weakness is so serious, although the Lord is gonna deliver, he really is, is because it's a paragraph I. The Bible makes it very, very clear that there's going to be a significant amount of, of, of persecution in end time prophecy. Read it there. It's growing rapidly in the world right now. I talked about it in one of the other messages that on the persecution watch lists, there are 60 nations that have severe persecution, but there's 200 nations in the world. So 140 don't have it. But Jesus, this is Thursday, John 15 and 16, he dies on Friday. Go back two days to Tuesday, Matthew 24, verse nine. He said, the day's coming when all 200 nations will hate you if you're true to me. So those 140 nations are going to be, things are gonna change before it happens, but, the great harvest happens and the great outpouring of the Spirit and the great transformation of the end time church happens. So I'm in. I'm saying, let's do it. But I want to be prepared and I want to be among a people who are prepared for it. Paragraph J here. There are important reasons to understand these end time prophecies. I'm not just reading them because they're interesting prophecies like, wow, I want to know prophecy. I have three very clear applications. 
I developed this in the message that I gave here on Sunday, January 1st. I'm not gonna really spend much time, but I just wanted to put it in front of you again. I don't wanna take time to go through it again. But application number one, Peter said it in 1 Peter 4. He says, arm yourself. Mentally, he's talking about. He's talking about conceptually. Arm yourself, prepare yourself to suffer, which means to embrace, to, to encounter persecution. Persecution. And we arm ourselves by developing a biblical understanding, a New Testament understanding of why God allows it, what are the benefits, what are the rewards, what does God promise to do, how will he intervene, etc. But the other way that we arm ourselves, one is mentally by gaining this insight, which we don't have that much of, but by the grace of God in the next months and years, we're as a community, we're going to grow in this. Then the second way we arm ourselves, the first is conceptually, the second is spiritually. We grow in our intimacy with God, with Jesus. In John chapter 15, two thirds of John 15 is about intimacy with Jesus, the first two thirds, and the final third is about persecution. Jesus put those two subjects together intentionally because there's something if we grow in our intimacy the fact of reality is that love is the most powerful force on the human heart. Love is far more powerful than fear. Love that's awakened and tenderized will overpower fear in the lives even of weak people like normal human beings, weak in our humanity. The third way we arm ourselves is by developing kingdom relationships of people that are seriously minded and radically committed. I'm not just interested in kingdom relationships of somebody says, yeah, I grew up in the church and yeah, I believe the Bible. I appreciate people, but I wanna have relationships with people that are radically serious about wholehearted obedience, even in the face of persecution. Now I can learn the biblical narrative, have my mind enlightened. I can have my heart empowered with love for Jesus but I still need other relationships with believers to do this thing successfully. The three of these together is what arms us and prepares us. Well, the second reason I wanna study these end time prophecies is number two, and I really have passion for this one. I want us to be intentional about preparing the next generation. The 15 and 20 year olds right now. Right now, the vast majority across our nation are so completely unaware of what I'm saying today it's not an issue of them remembering it. They've never heard it once. And they're gonna be blindsided in a horrible way if the shepherds, the spiritual moms and dads, in these next five and 10 years do not prepare them biblically. And I'm a part of a community here of spiritual moms and dads that take this seriously. And then the third application is we wanna help the persecuted church. So we want to understand it. And again, I talked more about that uh, earlier. I mean, the first uh, Sunday of January, top of page three. I want to point out two sobering details that Jesus puts in this passage. John 16, verse two. I mean, it's the bombshell. These are the, he highlights the two most costly. And I would even add the two most painful types of persecution. The first one he points out, again, we as Gentiles might miss it. It's the relational and the social and the financial pain and cost they will pay that people even with a Bible background, people that have a similar background, a family that says, yeah, we will love the Bible. We grew up in the same spiritual community together. They will drive you out of that community, out of that synagogue. This is the apostles can't even believe this statement hardly. They don't really believe Jesus is gonna die the next day. They're still a little bit deer in the headlights. I mean, not a little bit, a lot actually. Then the second, he goes, it's gonna go more than social and relational and economic persecution. It will be physical for some people. Now, not every believer is gonna experience all of these things. But the problem is, I believe it will be a minority of people who, are, who actually are martyred. It will still be millions, but there'll be hundreds of millions that aren't martyred. And so the issue is nobody knows who is and who isn't going to have this affect them. 
and the Lord keeps it that way, so he wants the whole community braced for it, though I don't believe the majority of them will be hit hard. I believe mostly it will be people in leadership. Not only, but mostly. That's the record of history. It was shocking to them when Jesus said they'll kick you out of the synagogue. In other words, we're familiar with the secular government persecuting us for loving Jesus, but not people in our spiritual community, religious people with the same, I mean, with a similar background of Bible-believing heritage and family members. Those are the ones Jesus is highlighting will do the persecuting. The secular government will too, but that's not what he's talking about. That is still serious, but that feels very different than when people from your own background and your own community do this to you. Paragraph B, they'll put you out of the community, and I've just, out of the synagogue. And I've already mentioned that you can read a little bit more. This is so important because inclusion in the synagogue was one of the most, uh, Israel's most important uh, ways they related socially, relationally, and it was very important that they're connected to the synagogue. Down at paragraph two, remember we're on Thursday night at the Last Supper, John 15, 16, 17. Go back two days earlier to Tuesday, Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Jesus said, I want to remind you, I told you on Tuesday, you're going to be betrayed by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. Because when he's talking about kicked out of the synagogue, that's brothers, relatives, friends, and parents. Those aren't strangers. Because in the Jewish community, most of the towns were small. Everybody knew everybody for decades. And he says, you have to, have, you have to know that obedience to me will come to that for some of you. Now, for the apostles, it's happened to every one of them. Paragraph C. The part that complicates it is that the people that are persecuting you, they claim to believe the Bible. They claim to be obeying God. Again, this is very different than the atheistic secular state does it, and they will do it too, but that's a different thing. Paragraph D, there's great reward. Jesus said, when this happens to you, it's a great reward. Luke 6, he goes, your reward will be great in heaven. Now, when people face death, meaning persecution, maybe they won't be killed. And I, th I think the majority will not be of the billion soul harvest. But I think millions will, but hundreds of millions won't. But the very fact that we will know friends, family members, associates, somewhere in the mix that it will the, the thought of it, the, the chance of it will be in front of everybody who loves Jesus. It will be a big conversation. And we have to, and when we face death, the chance of death, a physical death, I mean martyrdom is what I mean. What we believe about Jesus comes really clear. We think we believe this. But they said, okay, if you do believe this, you die. Jesus, I'm really counting on you being the resurrection and the life. I'm really counting on this. Well, I thought you believed that. Well, I do, but you, I hope you really are. I mean, it really brings it up close and personal what we believe. I have here in paragraph D in the middle, we have to settle the death issue. Meaning, are we people that believe he's the resurrection, we're sons of the resurrection, do we believe it even if they kill us? And you don't typically believe that one afternoon because you read the verse, oh, man, that's something you talk about, you think about, you talk to Jesus about. I have here at the paragraph D, I just have to say this, I'm running out of time, but I need to slip this in. The end time persecution is gonna discourage a whole lot of ministries today in the Western world that are really embracing the showmanship spirit on the platform. There's so much showmanship in preachers and ministry and worship teams. There's so much going on that's unnecessary on stages. And there's a whole lot of folks, they're putting tons of money to getting more popular, get more likes, more people buying their stuff, their sermons, their music, their messages, blah, 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 blah. But what's gonna happen, the reality, the most well-known leaders will be the one the government's coming after. And many of the folks that are pushing hard to get famous, they're gonna be running from the stage. 
So you're praying and fasting, God will give you a great, powerful ministry. Be careful what you wish for. I mean, go for it, but it's the apostles they aimed at. And through church history, it's the main leaders, some of the others as well. But that's who they target. But the Lord's gonna purify the showmanship spirit, the, 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 the look at me spirit that's so prevalent in the Western church. It's gonna be who's willing to die for Jesus, take a stand and be bold. And go, okay, let's, I'm all, but that, it's gonna be so different and that encourages me, that part. Let's look at top of page four. Well, on top of page four, what happens is that God raised David is the man in the Old Testament that the Lord, that experienced more persecution from family members and religious leaders in his community. I'm talking about in his family and in his community of any man in the Bible. It was King David, much more than any other person. So he's the prominent biblical picture. And I would say Jeremiah is probably the guy there's more text on that was persecuted. Moses some, Elijah some, Joseph some, but David far more than anybody. Then Isaiah 55, the Lord says, I want to make it clear, I made David a picture, a model for others to know that when I'm raising up a king after my own heart, I'm going to, this is how I'm going to train him. And God trained David in a pretty intense way. God trained David under the tutelageship of an angry, jealous King Saul, betrayal by his family, betrayal by his countrymen that all had biblical heritages. And David was trained to understand God's heart, God's leadership, how to walk in meekness, how to give mercy, how to receive mercy. He learned about generosity. And God said, David's in the seminary of the Holy Spirit of betrayal. He was betrayed more than any man in the Bible. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, when Jesus was talking to the apostles, that was clearly the man that was the prototype and the model, and he was meant to be seen as a model. Paragraph uh, B here. God raised David up as a king after his own heart, and God taught him. He, he was persecuted. He had trouble the whole 40 years of his reign, plus the 10 years before his reign. I mean, he had, from about age 20 to 70, he all, not every season, but always it emerged again, betrayal by the spiritual community that he was a part of and family members. And David was trained in this, I call it the seminary of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I call it the seminary of Saul. If God wants to raise up a king like David, he allows those kinds of people to be in their life. God trained him and he said, and look at Psalm 25, he said, God, show me your ways, teach me your path. He was learning about humility. He was learning about trusting the Lord, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I've taught the life of David. I'm not, saying this, I'm not trying to be boastful, but I've taught the life of David for about 45 years plus, and probably I've taught it, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 10 times, verse by verse, all the way through. I, I don't really know, but maybe 10 times. My point being is, in, is that I'm familiar with David's life. And so I've drawn from his life, and my, I, I just wanted to give these three chapters, my three go-to passages over these 45 years, 1 Samuel 24, 1 Samuel 26, Psalm 31. I wanted to identify them for you, because some of you might not know the life of David. Paragraph C, David refused under betrayal and persecution. He refused to answer back and to take matters into his own hands. Now, when the Philistines, the pagans attacked him, he went to war and he defeated the enemies of the Lord. That was one thing. Persecution is not when the Amorites or the Philistines or the other groups attacked him. That's not persecution. It, persecution, it's when it's within the family of faith or the so called, they claim to be in the family of faith. Some pretty dubious where their faith really was, but they all were looking for a Messiah and believed in God's promises for Israel. He refused to answer and to strike Saul back and those that betrayed him. And my favorite sentence, I have it here, Matthew, uh, 1 Samuel 24, 15. It's my, been one of my favorite Davids. I got about 10 favorite David sentences, about 10 of them. But this is one of them. David in the conflict of betrayal 
from the religious family community, from his friends and family members, and from his, quote, presidential court, the king's court, he was betrayed a number of times by his own team. David would say this sentence, let God decide, or other translations, let God judge. I'm not going to bring the judgment, I'm gonna take my hands off, and God will judge or decide the matter. And that's what God requires in the seminary of the Holy Spirit because David learned many, many things in that posture. Because often, God did decide and vindicated David, but often years later, in a way that David might not have thought. Like I always say, Lord, I want you to vindicate me my way and my time, which is like yesterday, if you don't mind. And God normally does it a different way and often many years later and sometimes only in the resurrection does he vindicate ultimately. But David said, I, I, I'm good with this. There's so many verses where he says that. Now, when the reason this is important, these Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel 24, 1 Samuel 26, Psalm 31, and there's others too, but these are my favorite three passages. Is that we wanna teach a whole generation of 20 year olds how David, the man after God's own heart, a leader after God's heart, engaged in the seminary of the Holy Spirit under persecution, and he had classes for literally 50 years in that seminary. In his 60s, he died at age 70, he was still being betrayed in his 60s. He had reprieves, but he would have intensity, reprieve, intensity, reprieve for 50 years. You think, well, we did it hard in our 20s, now we're gonna just go into the glory of God. No, for 50 years, different seasons, he was back in that seminary because God wanted him to be a model and a witness to the body of Christ, to redemptive history of what it looked like to be trained by God for leadership. So I want a group of 20 year olds. I don't mean a group, whatever, whatever that means. We wanna get 20 year olds familiar with this narrative. So when the betrayal, because persecution is one thing by the secular uh, governments, but betrayal when it's by the community of faith, I mean, I mean that persecution is betrayal. That's a way different. And for those of you that are just so interested in hearing more about betrayal, <laughs> Friday, session three, I'm talking about persecution and how to face and overcome betrayal. Because we're gonna really break down a bunch of passages, how Jesus did it, the apostles did it, David did it. So that's this Friday, that's session three. And we're still in John chapter 16. For those of you that just can't wait to hear more about being betrayed and how to be kind. But here's my point, and I'm coming to the end here. When the Holy Spirit is establishing an important kingdom purpose, wherever he's doing that, and there's about a thousand places in the earth, maybe a million, I don't know, thousands of places he's establishing important kingdom purposes. But here's what I wanna tell you. Whenever he's doing that, there are always people that the enemy will inspire, but God will use to test and train his young Davids. Always, in every move of God. There'll be an anger, there'll be a jealous King Saul or two, a jealous leader or two, that you're moving in on their turf and he will throw the sword. Or, or he threw the spear and swung the sword. There will be the rebellious young Absaloms in every one of these movements. There will be the money-loving Judases. And be clear, Judas betrayed Jesus because he loved money. That's what it says. There will be angry uh, 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 Pharisees, religious leaders, angered for another reason. David was betrayed by his father-in-law Saul, his wife Michael, his cousin Joab, the main uh, uh, advisor in his court, Ahithophel, he was, he, was he was betrayed over and over by his brothers. In 50 years, he had these seasons. And at the end, God said, he did it right. He had failures, but he landed right as a picture of what I want. So let's look at these two uh, examples in 1 Samuel 24 and the 1 Samuel 26. I'm gonna give you the, the, the rapid fire because you kind of know these stories anyway. I just want him in front of you. You can read the details. Paragraph D, Saul has been chasing David with 3,000 soldiers to kill this one man. 3,000, David had 400 on his team, then it grew to 600, it gets 3,000. And one day, in a cave, King Saul, who's leading the 3,000, 
goes to take a nap. He falls asleep in the cave. It's the cave David's hiding in. David and his guys go, oh, my goodness. And fall, Saul, the king saw the head of the 3,000. He falls asleep. David's leaders go, this is the Lord. David said, no, this, he's not a Philistine. He's one of the community of faith. No, no, I'm not touching him. And his guys go, David, get with it. This is God. What are you wanting? But wait, he's been chasing you in it up seven years. Maybe the five-year mark here or something like that. Take him out. And David goes, no. And look what he says, verse 12. David said this. No, David said this to Saul because Saul woke up. And David tells him later when David's in a place of safety, he goes, hey, Saul. Verse 10, the Lord delivered you into my hands. Saul's kind of over the way, and David's in a place of protection after he wakes up because Saul cut his robe and says, look, I got your robe. Saul looks down and goes, oh, my goodness. You were in that cave? Oh, my goodness. And he goes, Saul, verse 12, I'm not going to touch you. I'm going to let the Lord decide. You're part of the community of faith, not just an anointed leader. You're part of the community of faith. My hand shall not be against you. God will decide between you and me. And the Lord did. First Chronicles 12 tells you God killed Saul, but it was some years later. It was seven years of being hassled by Saul. I mean, seven, come on, what about one year? God did take out Saul, and David didn't touch him. Well, David restrained his servants in chapter 24, chapter 26. It's a little bit time later. He finds Saul asleep again. David's men say, David, you blew it. You missed God the last time. Kill him. David said, I'm not going to. Not going to. And so then David gets in a place of safety again. You can read the story. Verse 9, uh, David says, we're not going to destroy him. The Lord will take him out. Verse 18, David says to Saul, hey, Saul, the Lord delivered you to me again. This time he has his spear. Last time he had his, uh, you know, part of his garments he cut. He goes, here's your spear. How'd you get it? I was next to you a couple hours ago. And he goes, I'm not going to kill you. God will deliver me in his time. In paragraph F, Psalm 31. I love this psalm. We see how David interacted with the Lord when betrayed in the community of God. And there's much betrayal in the community of God because that will train God's people in a way that the secular betrayal uh, attack is, is different. That's not betrayal when it's the secular world out there. It's betrayal when it's inside, but that's the most intense seminary uh, of the Holy Spirit, when it's in, they kick you out of the synagogue and your own people come against you. Here's what David says. Look at Psalm 31. We know the passage. He tells God, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then in verse 15, my times are in your hands, meaning you will answer the way you want, when you want. And it was always years later, like, oh, come on, Lord, not years, please. <laughs> but this phrase, into your hands I commit my spirit, that doesn't mean when I go to heaven, you will receive me. I mean, that's part of it, but that's not the main point. When David says, I commit my spirit, I have it written here. David means the things that touch my heart the deepest. My promises in God, my finances, my physical safety, my reputation, my social relationships. I'm trusting you with them because they were telling lies about David all over the nation. The king and all of his men were pushing all kinds of false reports about David. David wouldn't answer any of them. He says, God, my I, I uh, commend my spirit into your hand, meaning everything dear to me, you got to answer it. Now here's, I want you to get this. When David committed the cause to God's hands, I have written here, he uh, brought God into the conflict. And if you take matters in your own hands, you better be smart and have a lot of endurance because you're, none of us are smart enough to solve them all ourselves. David said, I'm not. I'm bringing God into the conflict by appealing to him and me not doing it myself. Years later, worship team, come on up. The greater David, years later, Jesus is on the cross. Into your hands I commit my spirit. He didn't mean when I die I will be with you. For sure, that was included he meant my messianic promises, my new leaders, their future, all of redemptive history in the future, my place as king in Jerusalem over the earth. I'm committing all of it to you, Father. I'm not going to touch them. I'm going to let you bring the promises, your time and your way. 
So it was years later. Look at 1 Peter 2. Peter's talking about this years later, about how Jesus entrusted. It's very much David language. This is like right out of 1 Samuel 24. Peter said, we got the David message. And then he showed it right in front of us. So therefore they walked it. He goes, when Jesus was being revivaled, he wouldn't, he wouldn't revile back. When they were cussing at him, he wouldn't only spoke words of kindness and truth. When he was suffering, he did not threaten them. He could have called angels down to destroy him. He was, no, no threats. Not, hey, you'll be sorry one day. No threats. He entrusted himself to God, just like David did. Peter says, he taught us that we were gonna be betrayed and of course, that drove us to the David story, even though David's not mentioned in John 16. That's clearly the prominent example in the Bible they all had. And then Jesus does the David exchange. He entrusts himself to God, and they kill him. He raises from the dead, but in God's time, all the nations of the earth will be under his kingship, and his glory will fill the earth, and his times are in God's hands. God's Jesus, his Father, you determine when and where and how. And beloved, that's our mandate. We're gonna obey the Lord in the seminary of the Holy Spirit, and when betrayal comes, we are gonna say, Lord, train us in your seminary. What does mercy and generosity and gratitude and kindness and diligence look like in this, in this situation? And that's what we wanna impart to the 20-year-olds. I mean, we want it ourselves, because we can't impart it if we don't have it. But beloved, that generation needs models of moms and dads that will do this for them. Well, amen and amen. Let's stand before the Lord.